Thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? Uh, I'll never forget the first time I ever heard Antoine Predock lecture. He, I mean, I won't do it as good as he did, but he goes, I'm going to talk like a free-range chicken. <laughs> it's nice not to be kind of plugged in uh, to a, an object. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go through these slides and... Uh, you know, we'll stop when everybody gets sick and tired of looking at all of them, but, um, and it'll take me just a little bit to get the hang of this clicker. So, uh, as Katya told you, uh, I went to Texas Tech. I graduated and I moved back to Dallas. That's where I was born. And uh, four years after I was there, actually three and a half years, a friend of mine from Texas Tech, uh, Tate Mooring was going to go on a raft trip down the Colorado River, and I invited myself along, and that's me riding the horn on the left, and uh, they, they don't let you do that anymore. Uh, that was one-handed and with a beer, so it, uh, but that's outlawed now. Uh, I don't know if y'all read anything by Craig Childs, but I love his, his books. He's like a naturalist and he takes you on these hikes that he goes on and this secret knowledge of water is all about the water places in the desert and this quote of his I always relate to because in Phoenix you know we're in Austin too um, just always trying to figure out what will be you know, tough and live when there's no water and then when it does come how do you harness it how do you slow it down and make it soak in and, uh, you know, all the things that we've done to uh, try to create these sort of new um, harsh landscapes. It's really, there's no brain surgery to it. It's really just practical stuff. And I think you'll see that as we go through. Um, but, you know, the desert, as you know, uh, what a difference. I was in the plane today and I looked out one window on the one side and there was the Rio Grande and then the other side was the Mesa, the dry desert Mesa. And it's always that uh, contrast and those edges that are uh, pretty interesting. Uh, but in Phoenix, you know, I was definitely inspired by the biomes of the desert. I mean, you can see quite easily the the ephemeral riparian zone of the uh, valley there, and then up on the desert Bajada, the desert slopes, the more arid uh, desert planting. And we, we use that a lot in our uh, landscapes, even in downtown urban areas. Um, I'm one of these that I, I just love to try to connect people with nature, even in the middle of cities. Um, I'm inspired by the ephemeral paths of water, um, and the arroyos, you know, uh, taught me that. I, God knows I never knew ephemeral water in Dallas before I, you know. <laughs> um, and then just the, the whole history of our region, the Southwest is just such an amazing uh, history and archaeology since I moved to Texas, it's like, I hate to say it, I don't think they care much about what came before uh, the Texas <laughs> Republic. Honestly, one, a project we worked on, they found some old uh, stones, some old dwellings, and the, the owner of the place said, ah, just use it for riprap on the, <laughs> I mean, they just don't seem to have the the care for archaeology there is here and in Arizona. But anyway, I love this image of going down to water. Uh, and then this is a, a map of the prehistoric canals in the Phoenix area, the Salt River Valley. That's the Salt River. And I don't know how familiar y'all are with Phoenix, but as you know, most of the time it's dry because of the dams further upstream. But the Hohokam a, pre, a prehistoric tribe hand dug all these canals that you see here 
to feed by gravity uh, to water their crops of that Salt River Valley. And then they disappeared for some unknown reason. Nobody knows if it was drought or sickness or what. Um, but the, the sort of the ghosts, the imprints of those canals were left behind. And uh, in the late 1800s, uh, the, the uh, white men and gals came and settled the valley and saw these old canals and redug them and got them going again. And Phoenix in the early 1900s was actually known as the city of gardens and trees. That's how the city fathers tried to promote Phoenix. And they really promoted tree planting and um, the canals were the hangout places and just it was, must have been a really verdant, beautiful uh, environment. But then uh, after World War II, they cut down a lot of those trees. They needed to widen the roads. And, you know, they thought the cottonwoods that a lot of people had planted were taking up too much water. And the, overnight, almost, the city of Phoenix totally uh, changed. There's a few little remnants in Phoenix left of these uh, canals. But, uh, and one of, the, one of the great things about Phoenix is we have these fabulous mountain preserves, but when you get down where those buildings are, it's a pretty harsh, you know, typical overpaved place that's, that's not kind to the pedestrian, for sure. Uh, and then I decided to, <laughs> this is kind of abrupt, but, um, you know, 22 years went by. <laughs> I feel like I have to give you a little of my background before I get into the project so you understand where I'm kind of coming from. But all my family is in the Dallas area, and uh, I started working on ranches in West Texas. And so, you know, Texas, I, I convinced my husband to move back, and uh, we moved to Austin. So uh, now it's sort of kind of, it's been, it's been a challenge, actually, just upping and moving to a place and just trying to start a practice. And, you know, Texans look at you real funny when you've left. And you went where? Arizona? Um, anyway, uh, so it's really been, you know, we've really worked hard <laughs> this last five or six years, and especially, too, with the economy. But, you know, we have this lots of dry, and then we also, nobody, you know, who uh, thinks about Texas, who's not that familiar with Texas, thinks we have places like this. But just outside of Austin, I mean, there are these grottos that are just phenomenal, uh, these beautiful uh, spring-fed rivers and streams and bald cypress and ferns. I mean, they're just like these amazing grottos. Oops. I'm sorry. Didn't get those. Um, so I moved back in 2007, and that summer it started raining, and it, it kept raining and raining and raining, and we had floods. It was amazing, and then um, we were excited at first <laughs> after being in Phoenix, you know, but um, after a while the house like literally turned green on the outside. I couldn't believe how much rain. And then uh, last year, 2011, was just one of the worst droughts ever. And this is Lake Travis, which is our major water source for Austin and the surrounding area. And we are like at 49% capacity. Those are, you know, these are boat docks up here. I mean, that's usually all underwater. So I thought I was going to have it so easy in Texas because they get 35 inches of rain compared to Phoenix is seven inches. But um, it's every bit as tough there, I think, um, because there's, there's tons of extremes. It gets really, really cold there, too, you know. So you really have to uh, be tough with what you do. And yet there are people that, you know, still, I mean, this is the typical treatment of most residential properties in Austin. It's the big lawn and the big, huge existing trees and that, you know, let's call it a day. That's it. St. Augustine and a little bit of fertilizer and water and um, anyway, 
I threw this in because uh, I was really perky back then. <laughs> I, I couldn't afford a good hairdresser, though. <laughs> I don't think she could have gotten those bangs any straighter. Um, but um, I've always been somebody that I, back then, I just, you know, when I would read Landscape Architecture magazine and everything, it just seemed like all anybody was into was hardscape, you know? And, um, and this was the first time I was ever in Landscape Architecture magazine. And uh, they interviewed me, and of course they put this quote up here, but it, I did. I remember thinking I, it felt like landscape architects were ashamed we had anything to do with plants. And I just always think it's such a critical, critical component of our work. And I would always, you know, I, I'm very, especially in hot climates, I am very judicious with the hardscape that I do. I don't, I don't, I mean, I love doing hardscape, but I don't, I don't want to overdo it. Um, so that was back then, and this is now. Uh, you know, after, gosh, I graduated in 81, so what does that mean? How many years is that? It's a long time. It's like 31 years. So this was, a, I don't know, six or seven years ago, and I went to Paris, and there was this woman holding up this bridge, and she just felt like, she looked like I felt at the time. I, she just was like, I had that bird, you know, with turds on her head and, and crying that tear of green and everything. And it, she just looked like I felt. I just, you know, I, sometimes I, you've just got to be prepared. It's kind of a battle out there to get things built and to, I mean, it's such an exciting career. Don't, I'm not trying to talk you out of it or anything like that, but it's, um, it's a challenge. People's expectations are huge. Budgets are low. Uh, maintenance is many times non-existent. And uh, anyway, so these sort of rule, it's not some, uh, so you know, what costs less? You can read it all. Um, and, and the most important, how can we design something that means something you know, to people, that they really care about it, care enough about it to take care of it? especially in the public realm. I mean, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Uh-oh. So anyway, uh, this is the Biodesign Institute, and it's at Arizona State University. And um, I love working with universities. It's fun because they're kind of like little miniature cities, and um, usually they are open to trying different things. and. Um, you know, kind of as a learning environment for the students. And so this was a project where this was uh, a new complex of, of buildings. And the Biodesign Institute, they, they study nature and plants and all kinds of things to try to create, uh, you know, solutions to disease, all kinds of problems. and. Um, they have researchers from all over the world come here. So the architects uh, design sort of this master plan of these three big, and they're huge, huge, you know, footprints of buildings. This is going to be the conference center. And so um, we proposed to, this was a side of campus that had just, it was, this was all a parking lot. and. Uh, lots of electrical lines, parking garages. And so we, this was a side of campus too that just didn't have a nice entry. The other side, you've got the Gamage Auditorium that Frank Lloyd Wright did, and um, it was just kind of a neglected side. So it was, it was fun to think about creating this uh, new garden entry that really was a gateway into campus as well as uh, a gathering place and setting for the Biodesign Institute. This is a big existing parking garage, and this was a uh, just a gravel and uh, some lawn retention basin. But we, and then the architects also chose to put this building up five feet from this street grade. And so we just started thinking about those biomes of the desert and you know, and then the fact that we had retention and still needed retention and 
uh, thought about creating a gateway with those sort of two biomes, um, you know, using the retention uh, as a place for a lusher, you know, mesquite boss garden and even an amphitheater that's surrounded uh, by a water harvesting garden and sloping plazas and uh, lots of shade. Um, this is a, this is the Salt River. Um, this is a historic photo of the Salt River. And uh, this was at one time in the floodplain of this river. Um, you can see now, here's what Tempe has done. They did a, like a rubber dam and created a lake on it. And then further down, this is Phoenix in the background there. Um, further down, there's a habitat restoration project. It's kind of interesting to see how the different cities have approached that river. Um, but anyway, it just, uh, that's a little rendering. This is after we got it built, but we did these rhythmic uh, cast concrete terraces that step up to the plinth. Um, and we redid terrace to define the bike paths a little more using our, you know, beautiful Palo Verde trees as uh, our main tree, and then these stepping sandblasted concrete walls up to the entry plaza. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this is the grove after it had grown a couple of years. So those are the Palo Verdes up on the upper terrace and then the mesquites down where the water is. And this is a photo taken down in that Palo Verde grove on the east plaza off of the uh, building. But, you know, these researchers look out their windows at this every day. And we used, you know, healing plants. I'm not such a purist that I don't ever, you know, I, I don't just use Arizona plants. This is aloe. It's a native of Africa. But just whatever's tough and will survive. Uh, this is the retention basin, and the biology students use it for uh, urban wildlife habitat study. You can see terrace, which turns into uh, it turns into rural there, which uh, as you go north turns into Scottsdale Road up in Scottsdale. Um, that's just a, an enlargement of the amphitheater. But I love the idea of nestling people down in those spaces. And, uh, you know, I mean, the fun part of going on a hike, on uh, going through the desert, is just finding those sheltered, shady places. And uh, that's what I always try to do in some of our projects. This is where the water comes into the uh, water harvesting garden. That was after it was just built. And then here are our stepping walls and stabilized decomposed granite. Uh, use a lot of that where I can, although, you know, a lot of uh, campuses, sometimes they don't like it because people track it in. So you've got to kind of be careful where you use it. But I love it. It just makes it feel cooler uh, not to always have to walk on concrete. And, you know, uh, ASU is very anti-fountain, and this was one of the uh, first times I kind of created this little terminus in our amphitheater as a, an irrigation seep. So when it's not running and it's truly, it's tied into the irrigation system, so it's just a valve on the irrigation system and waters uh, the greenest part of the desert garden there. Um, but the rest of the time it's dry and is more about the memory of water than, than the presence of water. But I, I feel strongly that people have got to have that, uh, that connection with water, uh, us urban dwellers in the Southwest. This is the College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. And, uh, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Okay, good. Uh, this was going to be the new footprint of the new building. This is their existing building right here, which is that. 
So this was the site when we first came to it. And um, I loved it because this parking lot was just like sloping right towards our site. And it just seemed like an opportunity to really get that water. Uh, our client was totally into us harvesting any water we could from the building also. And they really wanted this to be an outdoor learning laboratory that uh, kids could conduct experiments out here and uh, just have a place for social interaction and uh, hangout space just outside of the classroom. I think those, those spaces between are just so important, especially in a campus, but everywhere really, downtown. Uh, so this, again, were some of the existing photos between uh, the existing architecture building and the photography building was just this concrete flume that connected in with the stormwater system of the campus. Um, so it was kind of obvious where this path of water was going through the, through the uh, site. So this was our concept. And uh, our first thought was to make this all permeable. You know, so this was, you would enter on this perforated deck uh, and all this is permeable underneath water is able to flow through the whole thing this was where that concrete flume was and uh, this was where we cut the parking lot and the idea was to get a tank in the building that the students could see which we did we got like a I think it's 40 feet tall and it's acrylic so you can see the water level in it it's right in here but the idea was to take the gray water, uh, condensate the storm water, uh, and create a riparian habitat, but also an overflow to go through the garden and slow the storm water down before it ultimately empties out into the, um, the campus storm water system. I'm still a big hand drawer. Uh, a lot of people don't, I mean, it seems like a lot of people don't do that anymore, but I, I still love to hand draw our concept plans, and uh, definitely the computer is a great tool, but I, I think it really uh, helps people give a feel of what's going on. Well, anyway, there was a budget cut, so we didn't get this all permeable, uh, but we did get our bridges in at least, so we were able to get the water through our project I'll show you this is a sunken classroom I wanted to put a fire pit down there but they decided they didn't want us to do that <laughs> um, so and these are very typical of the sketches we do to try to show people um, kind of how the system could work in kind of a cartoony form um, taking the water and which tanks go to what and where the condensate comes in and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but this is, so this was what we had proposed to be the uh, perforated deck. Um, these are our uh, bridges and you can see the garden's really grown uh, using native plants. Uh, these are actually a hybrid mesquite tree that are like big green umbrellas. Oops. Oops. Um, that's the outdoor classroom. And that's kind of the pond and the scupper that comes from the tank that you see in the background there. And we're growing Mascagnia macroptera up the trellis. And this was like the first big rain that they had, and it totally filled up the garden, and it flowed out and soaked in. Um, but man, it was pretty dramatic that first time that happened. <laughs> so we're, w w the first couple of years, we reduced the potable water use by 87%, you know, just using what the building produced. And uh, now that the plants are established, they're getting closer to almost being 100%. So that's pretty cool, you know. Um, it's looking down at the pond. 
They do have a problem with students putting goldfish in the pond. They're, they've got, you know, native Arizona fish, and the goldfish actually eat the native fish, so they have to have goldfish patrol. Uh, <laughs> We use a lot of our demolition materials as riprap and, um, you know, just always trying to figure out how can we do something that costs less money. Most of the money on this project went to the architecture and we had to do a major sort of community fundraising drive to uh, pay for all the landscape and the irrigation. But it really, it, it was fun, you know. Uh, just a shot of students sitting out there. And this is Rodney, the roadrunner, who comes there, uh, I guess, almost every week. But it's just amazing to me when you look at the uh, aerial where that is. It's a total vehicular part of Tucson. And uh, it just, it's amazing to me that he can find his way there. This is the Polytechnic University. And this was a, an old Air Force base, and it looked like, you know, anywhere USA. It just had tons of uh, asphalt paving, and um, uh, it had a road that went through campus. Actually, that road used to be here, and then there's another one up on the other side. It just looked like an Air Force base. It was sterile. It didn't say Arizona at all, and they were having a hard time attracting students to this campus. Well, they got this money to do this major academic complex. This was where the existing sort of, some of the existing Air Force buildings that have been converted to campus buildings were. Um, this was a new student union that we had worked on a few years before. Um, but the, the architecture is by Lake Flato and RSP Architects. Uh, I love working with Lake Flato because they really care about landscape and they, they want the landscape to be integral to their architecture. It makes it so much more fun when you're working uh, with architects that feel that way. And um, so they laid out these buildings. We worked on the site plan together. Uh, and we proposed that we take that street out that used to flood and turn it into an arroyo and then uh, made the campus, the new campus mall, run along it with bridge connections to the old part of campus. And all throughout this project, we, we tried not to use any pipes or anything and really tried to express through the campus where the water flowed. And again, it's only, you know, periodically, every once in a while, again, we only get seven inches of rain, but even just having that sort of, I, I keep saying that memory of water, just that place for it to go actually makes it feel, makes it feel good. Um, so that picture on the left is what it looked like. Uh, and then this on the right is taken in almost the same spot but, uh, where we scooped out that street, worked very closely with our civil engineers and uh, you know, we'd do a grading plan, then they'd do a grading plan, then we'd do one, then they'd do one. But, you know, you really need to collaborate with the engineers, and they, they really enjoy it because you're kind of making what they do the star of the show, you know. Um, usually, they're just trying to get the water out of the way as soon as possible. My dad's a civil engineer, and he thinks I'm nuts because I... Like I'll call him and uh, tell him that I think, Dad, uh, we had an inch of rain. I don't think one drop of water went off our property. <laughs> and he just thinks that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you can see, I mean, the desert is so resilient. It's, uh, it really grows and does well. But it's really helped this campus, and student enrollment has gone up, and you know, they seem very pleased with it. So that's the student union back on the kind of that old part of campus where these bridges connect to. And that's part of the student union that we did. So we kind of merged these more organized desert plantings. And then when it hits the arroyo, it gets more naturalistic and then gets more organized as you get into the academic 
complex again. So these are just like some concept sketches for some of the courtyards. This was the ag business courtyard. And so we wanted the feeling of an orchard, very simple plan, a grove of trees. We wanted to do the cistern that would harvest the condensate in the center. But they cut it. Y'all are going to hear this a lot. They cut it from our budget. So um, instead, we did these. Um, uh, we got rid of that central feature and designed these benches that are like irrigation cisterns that recall irrigation. And, uh, you know, I'm very inspired by Spanish, you know, travel <coughs> and seeing how they express irrigation and drainage throughout. Uh, it just enriches the hardscape. Uh, but if you happen to be sitting there when that bubbles up and goes to water those trees, it's kind of a, a fun thing. Another courtyard, which was more about passing through, and this is a <coughs> retention canal. We called this the canal courtyard. We proposed a big, long arbor through it. Um, this was what it looked like um, before, so we got to rip all that out. And um, here's the arbor that we did. You know, we have we're so lucky because it's. It's hard not to look good when you're taking something like that out, you know? I mean, really. Uh, just another sketch of another courtyard. This is, just shows you how we let the water go through everywhere. This was a, an outdoor classroom courtyard. Uh, we got our Arizona sycamores going there, uh, a cistern of water um, that sometimes filled, sometimes not, a living wall that we did, and we planted it with all chuparosa. Um, but again, giving people that little connection with water. Uh, this is salvaged concrete. There were just acres of concrete to use, and so we used it in some of our arroyos and um, areas. This is a current project that we're working on. Uh, it's University of Texas at El Paso, and it's a campus transformation project. And so UTEP is about right here. And this is a, a slide of all the watersheds in El Paso. And this arroyo right here flows right through campus. And uh, this is kind of a, an interesting deal. I don't know if you've been to their campus, but I guess in the early 1900s, the college president's wife had just read a National Geographic article about Bhutanese architecture and decided that that's how that campus should be and convinced her husband of it, that it should be like a Bhutanese village in the mountains. And boy, they've stuck with it. <laughs> I mean, uh, <clears throat> so I'll show you. Uh, but and then El Paso is just like this wild city. I mean, you can see Juarez from the campus. They've actually had bullets come across the river into campus. So I, I feel like El Paso is really a place that we can help. You know, I, I've always flown over it going back and forth from Phoenix. And I'm really excited about this opportunity. But anyway, this is an old photograph, and the, the campus is in this zone. So you can see that this arroyo, you know, it serves some pretty big uh, watersheds from the Franklin Mountains there. And that water eventually ends up in the Rio Grande. Um, these are some historic photos of the, the ASARCO, the, I forget, what did that stand for? American Standard is a major mining company. And uh, even up until the 70s, El Paso had some pretty polluted soils. They were noticing the kids weren't learning as quickly as other kids around the country. And they did tests, and the EPA came down on them like crazy. Um, lots and lots of chemical pollutants in the soils um, and shut a lot of that down, put a lot of restrictions on it. 
But here is the campus in the 30s. Here's the big arroyo. But so they built, they've been building all these Bhutanese buildings, and then they've been real good about roads. I mean, it's a very vehicular campus. Um, and it's so weird because they've got this this great arroyo, and then they have this mountain, and then it's almost like the mountain burps up. It, it just like exposes itself in little places. It's, and so our proposal was just to, to unite the mountain and the arroyo. Um, and, and this is a current shot of their central space. And the city of El Paso actually already thinks of UTEP as the oasis of El Paso. So I'm really excited to <laughs> help them <laughs> build on that a little bit. But uh, so our proposal, and here's what I mean when I say the mountain burps up. I mean, it's really funny. These rock outcroppings will just appear out of nowhere. So uh, one of our proposals, and I'll show you the sketch, is to take this parking out and make this the big central civic space. And then they have all these weird uh, evergreen lollipops, uh, trees. That rock outcropping is in there. And we're going to uncover it and bring it back. So we're going to have this central lawn with these arroyos that take the water on both sides, sub-arroyos that will connect to this. And we'll take pedestrian paths along them. and. Um, just really try to reduce the paving on this campus. So here's kind of uh, our campus transformation plan. And so our, our uh, contract was just for uh, concepts for them to raise money. And we've just been given the go ahead to go through CDs for this zone and potentially for the whole thing, which is very exciting. Um, these are just kind of all the different areas um, that we're going to be working on. So this is that uh, central green with a stabilized DG Paseo around the sides, the arroyos coming down on the side. And we'll be literally cutting into that what was a green mound of turf. We're going to sculpt that and cut that back and bring back the rock and bring back an arroyo here and here and uh, <clears throat> do mesquite bosques and uh, Chihuahuan Desert gardens that connect the pedestrians through the campus and keep cars kind of out of the way. This is Leech Grove. It's another little part of this. And then Old Main Trost was the architect of the first building. And that's like the most beautiful one on the campus. And it's, it was back when you know buildings were a little smaller. I, when Bhutanese goes big, it, it gets intense. <laughs> I mean, it really does. But it'll be better once we have these trees going. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to help a lot. So, and we always, you know, some of these are slides that from some of our presentations to the client, but we always try to show them photos of other projects that help us sell, you know, what we're doing for them. But again, this just kind of shows how the water is going to go through there. Right now, the water goes zipping down those asphalt streets and uh, flies into the arroyo, which causes all kinds of scouring and so we're really hoping to slow it down. Uh, quick hand sketch over a computer generated aerial. Um, this is a Bhutanese shrine and there's going to be a Bhutanese shrine that uh, is going to be part of this that they have from Bhutan and they've had monks over that have blessed it and all kinds of, I mean, they're really, really serious about it. <clears throat> um, just, and then as we get it more refined uh, into the computer generated graphics, they have a, an event called Minor Palooza, 
and uh, <laughs> they're the miners. That's their <laughs> mascot, you know, uh, from their mining tradition. And uh, so this is where that event is going to happen. And because this is all sloped, this uh, oval is going to sort of rise out of the ground on one end, and then it's going to be cut back into the grade back here. So it creates all kinds of amphitheater areas where they can have bands set up. Um, for minor palooza, they might have, you know, 20 bands out there. So that was an important uh, component. And I might finally talk a client into these light fixtures that uh, Escafe makes in, in Spain. They're these beautiful core tin, uh, natural steel. To me, they look like Ocotillos. And I think they'd be really fun there, but we'll see. Um, just a shot at the Arroyo. Uh, oh, okay, this is, I'm sorry, this is left from my little presentation to them, but this was the precedent that we showed them of how we can, we can create uh, these Arroyos back through campus. And then Lake Flato is also working on it, and so they looked at this building and uh, proposed to do arbors on that and to try to step it down to the street. It's severe. They're, the buildings are so big and so tall um, to kind of bring them to a human scale as much as possible. A new east entry. This is the Arroyo, but really celebrating where you come over the Arroyo. Right now it's just like a black asphalt street. Um, two new little plaza spaces, and then we're going to create trails and bridges all throughout the Arroyo and uh, help get water from these buildings to help water uh, the Arroyo in a softer way than just a raging torrent. Old Main. And again, right now a huge asphalt road goes in front of it, and we're going to take it away, and emergency vehicles will still get through there, but make it feel more pedestrian. Leech Grove. This is an, another <laughs> over hardscaped area. Uh, we're calling it Minor Canyon, uh, but we're going to rip all this asp or concrete up and uh, create a new kind of more interesting and softened uh, way. It's a major pedestrian route up to the Sun Bowl for football games. This is a huge new Bhutanese parking garage that they've built. <laughs> um, so the Phoenix Convention Center we worked on, and that's where the ASLA conference is going to be held next week. Um, but one of the things uh, that I want to show you is this little plaza that we worked on. and. We convinced our client to let us have part of the condensate from this building, and I, I just love the idea that Phoenix, as sweaty as it is, that we're getting some of the building sweat uh, to, to water our project. We proposed a 140-foot long living wall here, um, and we're getting the condensate to uh, from the building to water it. So we have a cistern inside the plaza or inside the convention center that you can see. Uh, and then the water exits out this flume, comes down these discs, and then goes into a trough at the top of our wall. Uh, we worked with engineers to help us get those holes just right so that you know it'd get water the whole way down. Um, but it helped us, you know, with this project because the Arts Commission ended up funding it and um, it, it worked. We did it with a, we built a 50 foot long one at our office first because we had never done one before. And uh, we just built it out of wire mesh and uh, we used soil similar to what you'd use on a roof garden, but we also used lava rock and soil fabric, and uh, we seeded it 
as well as uh, plugged it with plants. But it, we wanted it to feel like a, you know, a Sonoran Canyon wall for these visitors that come through here. We thought that uh, after doing that project, man, wouldn't it, it would be really neat if we could do that down our streets, you know, and harvest the condensate and the stormwater, uh, narrow the streets in downtown Phoenix, and we got the opportunity to work on one uh, in downtown Phoenix for the new ASU downtown campus. And uh, just some quick sketches on that. But there were old canals that used to come through here, the smaller lateral canals. And so it was sort of reinventing those old canals in a new way that helped um, you know, create a more a better pedestrian environment. Uh, these, this is where the water collects. You wouldn't believe what it took to talk the city into this, um, just to get these little curb cuts in here. I mean, you would have thought we were asking for, I don't know, their firstborn or something. But it ended up taking like a meeting of like 32 people, with the city manager and the vice president of ASU. And, and the, who was against it? The Parks Department. <laughs> um, but they just, they were just afraid it was going to be too much maintenance. And anyway, this I know just looks like a ditch with water in it, but it was so cool to see in a place where people don't really take care of trees and don't water them very much. Uh, it was just great to see the water going to where we needed it. And this is like an inspiration, one of the old lateral canals. Uh, this is further down at the journalism building. And uh, we did a cistern here that gets the condensate from the building. When it collects here, it then spills into our stormwater and condensate canal. Always on tight budgets, but uh, this is another project. This is like a typical little uh, project that we get sometimes, these renovations. This was a, an existing courtyard, and the waiting room was in here except there was a hallway dividing the waiting room from the courtyard. And it's a good thing because that courtyard was pretty pathetic. Um, they obviously didn't have much of a budget, but they got a donor and we got Gensler to team up with us and uh, propose this real indoor outdoor environment. And we got selected to do it. This is a concept plan. Uh, this is looking down on it. This is the first year it was built, so it's not really filled in yet. But it had to look good from up above as well as down within. Um, just looking out. Use these little scrims. So this is where the hallway came out, and uh, Ginsler did that beautiful ceiling, and it just really connected the space. It's been a real good thing for the hospital. Oops. And these little scrims are just like these glowing little bits of color out at night. And um, This is a project, or I'm, we did the, the streetscape area, but I want to show you the roof garden. Uh, it's the dial headquarters. And uh, Sonoran plants are the perfect plants for these roof gardens. Um, they had incredible views of the McDowell Mountains, and uh, we used stabilized DG as the walkway surface, and then stone for some of the lower planter walls. Brought in uh, Palaverdes. We could only put those over the columns, and uh, got our depth with these cast concrete planters. But incredible roof up there. I mean, it's really um, like the ideal spot to do a roof garden. This is the Phoenix Art Museum that we worked on with Todd Williams and Billy Chin. And we had a, a really tough time with this client. I mean, they had one of those building committees, you know, where it's the board. And um, 
Each of them had some horrible experience, prior experience with a fountain and didn't want any water. And uh, this is Central Avenue, which is a very busy, busy main street. And we really wanted to create a refuge. And uh, Todd Williams just finally threw his hands up and said, I give up. I mean, you know, Christy, do what you can. And so we came up with this scheme to, uh, present to them. I mean, they really, in Phoenix, you really have trouble that people want to pull up right with their cars to the front door of places. I mean, we had the same thing at the Phoenix Botanical Garden, the Desert Botanical Garden. So it's really kind of a, always a, a debate trying to get them to let you keep the cars out here so you can create a nice uh, space for decompression on your way in. So this is a courtyard with a, a lawn plinth for sculpture. They wanted to be able to use this for outdoor events. Uh, this is our rain fountain. Anyway, we were able to salvage a bunch of um, palabreas from where the construction was taking place. So we use those in a real you know, sculptural little bosque going into the museum. And you can see that indoor-outdoor relationship. Beautiful new entry that uh, Todd and Billy did. Uh, this is a project. I'm going to just show you a, a few projects in Texas. This is uh, right off the highway there, right in town, across from the Thunderbird Hotel. And my client had bought this building to be sort of a community gathering place and a concert hall. and so. It used to be a motel, and there used to be buildings right here. This is the big asphalt parking lot. Uh, you could see where water just went through the property to connect with this creek that ran along beside it. Um, so here was our plan. She, she wanted a, some sort of an intermission space, like a courtyard. Um, the bar is here. And so we proposed a West Texas beer garden, uh, an outdoor seating area here. But if you wanted to be out in nature, you could go out and sit at the fire pits in these little steel and decomposed granite islands out floating in this sea of uh, grasses. This is a rainwater fountain. We harvest the water off this roof, spills in here, and then in a big storm event, it overflows and then goes into our orchard here. So this is, uh, and we get this part of the water just comes right into the front little island here. And we did little foot bridges from the drop off area. Water travels through here and goes into the garden where that asphalt parking lot that I showed you was. That's a shot of that. Um, it's amazing what seed <laughs> does when you, we planted mainly seed and some one gallon plant material. Um, we used, I don't know, some uh, bigger trees here and there, but uh, it really took off. This is where that drainage area was in the parking lot and we scooped it out and really made it a feature as part of the outdoor area. Uh, just pretty simple construction. That steel pipe cut boulders from the area. Um, that's McNichols tread plank. They use it on industrial stairs and we use it for foot bridges and things because it's so sturdy. It doesn't need anything but a couple of beams underneath it. Um, so it doesn't take a ton of structure. We did uh, freestanding gabion walls as our courtyard material. And uh, you can see that in the background. We have four inch posts that go into footings down below. And uh, we played off the architects, uh, you know, some of their details with our arbors and things.
So in a rain event, that water comes from the gutter into here and drops in. And that's when we were under construction and it rained and rained and rained. Um, this is a, a place where they have big dining parties. They have a lot of weddings and stuff here, as well as concerts. Uh, this is the Live Strong Foundation in Austin. It's one of the first project, the first project I, I actually worked on in Austin. And um, as usual, it's a parking lot, you know, and the, the big part of the project was the parking lot, entry monumentation, and a little tiny courtyard. And uh, the architects were Lake Flato. And this was an old warehouse, and they cut, it was a, a tilt-up, concrete, paneled warehouse. And we took, when they took that out, they took that bite out of the building so that we could have this courtyard, and we reused all that concrete out in the hardscape for the walkways, for the monumentation, for the walls, for the parking stripes, even. Um, so you can see here them taking that concrete up. We saw cut it all. Here's some of our retaining wall. Here's our little parking stripes, <laughs> curbs. <laughs> we used every bit of it. And I just loved it. I mean, I just think it says live strong. Uh, I, I loved that it was all roughed up. And a, a guy I was working with at the time back in Austin called me. I, Actually, I was in New Mexico when I got the phone call. Christy, the contractor just destroyed one of the panels of the concrete that we we're supposed to use for the monument. And I said, let me look at it when I get back. And, but I think it adds character. Um, uh, this is one that's just been built, and I, I have a few photos of it. This is at UT, at, um, at the Austin campus, at uh, Dean Keaton in Guadalupe. It's a pretty prominent site. And UT, you know, is not known for a lot of diversity in its landscape. I mean, it's mainly lawn and, and big, huge, beautiful oaks um, and Asian jasmine. But Lady Bird Johnson went to this school. She was a graduate of the communications school, and uh, we talked them into doing, uh, I don't know, a more regional garden. Uh, still leaving these huge live oaks all around the perimeter and one specimen a specimen as big of one as we could afford. But then uh, a biofilter fountain. KUT is the public radio station that is housed in here, so this is a performance lawn. But we did a, a grid of mesquites. Uh, this is the cafe, little dining plaza, entry plaza here. This is a biofilter fountain that takes the first flush off of the roof and then recirculates it. We're also getting the condensate. And boy, you can really collect condensate in Austin because of how humid it is. Um, we're, we think the mechanical engineer, uh, his calculations are that we're not going to need any potable water once this thing is up and running because we get so much condensate from the building. Uh, right when we need it, too. So here are our cisterns in the back. Uh, so just a little bigger plan here. Bioswale, this is where a lot of our drainage ends up in here. And we set our catch basins up at the sidewalk level so this brims up before it goes into the campus stormwater system. This was my little sketch showing, showing them how we were going to do it. Uh, here's the cisterns. Um, quick little computer rendering. And then this is, it's literally just finished. So um, here's our bioswale, a bridge going to these outdoor classrooms, the plaza. And, you know, I'm getting a lot of funny looks on using mesquites. You know, uh, Texans have a thing about mesquites. The ranchers, because they overgraze their property, um, 
the mesquites have taken over some parts of people's ranches, and so they blame it all on the mesquites. But anyway, they're a tough, great plant. They're like, like I said, they're like umbrellas. But these are these sunken outdoor classrooms, little tables. Um, this is our biofilter fountain. It wasn't running in this photo. These guys just got that going this week. <clears throat> There's our McNichols tread plank again. These uh, outdoor classrooms originally were going to be stabilized, decomposed granite, but UT had just had a project where um, they had supposedly used stabilized granite and they it ruined the floor of their new building and so they banned it and so we used this permeable paver. And actually, you know, I, I thought I was just gonna, it was not gonna be very good, but I kind of like those pavers. It's all cast in place. This is board formed concrete. So the water wells up in here and then spills through and spills a couple of times goes back to the tank and recirculates. And then in a storm, it overflows into the bioswale. We used uh, Hilfiker uh, Trinity walls. They're basically gabions with soil fabric, and then you plant in them. Um, I'm just going to show you a few little residential projects. So this is a, a project in Phoenix. This is a before. Uh, photo here. This was our plan. This had been historically flood irrigation here. It was sunken down lower and so we kind of emphasized that and made this sort of feel like a little bridge and then into a courtyard. Um, they hardly had any shade before and you know these mesquites you've got to hand it to them. They just really give great great uh, shade. This was their backyard and th when they had me here the first time I said you got to get rid of that pool uh, <clears throat> because it was just like right off the back door and you practically fell in it uh, as you walked out. And uh, I said they had this really long piece of property. I said you should do a really long lap pool and create a living area up next to the house and so they did and we it really changed the way that house felt this is a typical phoenix house typical front yard landscape and uh, we talked them into i hate circular driveways we talked them into doing a parking court and then creating the feeling of an arroyo up to the front door so that's after and we popped out an arbor to kind of call your attention to the front entry. But I love for people to enjoy every piece of their property, you know, not just the backyard, but the front and the side. Oh, that was the looking the other way. Create a little front court. Uh, this is the Frieder residence. It was an old adobe, and uh, I don't know if y'all knew. Bill Frieder, he was a basketball coach for ASU, but he and his wife moved here from Ann Arbor. They bought this adobe. John Douglas was the architect, and they just restored it and did an addition, just the most sensitive, you know, really well done work. And then she told me, Jan told me, Christy, I just want this to feel like a little farm lady's garden. I don't want it to feel designed, you know. Uh, so we, it had really been under some neglect. Uh, we brought in all these desert trees that were coming off of actually where they, that photo of me in Landscape Architecture Magazine with the straight bangs. They, the Corps of Engineers were, had dug a big drainage channel and they were taking all these desert trees out of there and we got a bunch of them at a reduced rate and used them all throughout the property to give her shade did a new courtyard, a lap pool. Uh, that's the setting. It's in Paradise Valley. That's how it looked when we started. And then after, and Jan really was used to lush, lush uh, gardens. And so this was a pretty lush Sonoran Desert garden for her. 
all this had been destroyed in construction and we brought, these are some of the trees we brought back. Courtyard and we used, you know, canyon plants, very simple materials. This is just like hand rubbed uh, integral color concrete. Uh, we designed the pool to feel like you're swimming in a canal in a desert wildflower meadow. Uh, she was a real flower person. <laughs> I mean, she loved flowers. We did an Ocotillo uh, fence around the back garden area that meets pool code. Um, this was in the middle of spring when it was just going crazy. Uh, made the cover of garden design. It was a really, it was exciting. <laughs> this is my house actually in Austin and uh, it had a big asphalt, circular asphalt driveway, a really big front yard, uh, a big piece of lawn. And uh, I had no work in Austin, so I felt like I had to do my yard to have something to show people in order to get work. Um, so we started in the back um, with this structure here. This is a, an artist and a drummer lived in this house. Um, she's a pretty well-known artist. They've moved to Marfa now. He was the, one of the founding members of the fabulous Thunderbirds. And uh, anyway, supposedly Johnny Depp and Kate Moss made out on that floor right there. <laughs> Uh, but we fell in love with the house. I mean, they really hadn't done much except build this studio. And of course, I instantly saw myself in that studio. And but what I fell in love with were all these trees. And I'll show you. But my I, the house sits up about eight feet higher than the street. And so the concept was to um, create check dams down to the street to slow the water down, kind of off the slope. Uh, the courtyard flooded the guest house. We found out that first year, and so uh, we had to totally lower the grade and regrade all of that. So I'll just show you these real quick. So that's a kind of the before picture with the asphalt driveway. This was just like a year after. It looks kind of totally different now. It's really lush. This is a before picture. They had a big Colorado River rock wall out by the street. That was the driveway and took that out. And I really wanted a test garden to test all these shade, native shade plants because I truly have not had that much opportunity to, with experience with shade. I mean, some light shade, but nothing like this. Um, that's how all the rock that we excavated from the courtyard we sit right on Swiss cheese limestone, um, but that's after everything's grown, and it's really just like kind of being in a forest. It's, this is a little area out in front where I've got a vegetable garden. It's a spot where I get sun. Um, this is a before picture and on the side of the yard, uh, and I hated this fireplace because it was always looked like it was screaming at me with this and it had these two ledges like these eyes I don't know it was creepy and and then it was tons of stone from the beautiful stone wall but then more stone and no green and so I just cleaned it up um, squared off the firebox and it added a fountain and let some um, garden bee along the wall, and then in framed our one little piece of lawn uh, to sort of give it a crisp edge. And then we use pea gravel. This is pea gravel. This is just from an, uh, there's limestone quarries all over Texas. So we got a piece and had somebody carve this fountain. And this is McNichols mesh. You can just order it and it makes great gates. And it looks like it's hand woven. It's really beautiful. Oops. Uh, that's my studio. And uh, used to be just these three little tiny stone steps up there. And I made a little uh, terrace area there. 
That's the before of the courtyard. And she had always tried to grow vegetables back here, but there's like this much soil. It's on solid rock. This is what flooded all the time. Um, I cannot get the grip of this. Um, so did a, a board formed concrete trough that's just kind of part of our daily life because we're constantly going in and out of the uh, studio. This is where I started out with my office and uh, now this is all kind of a guest house and a home studio. Uh, almost done, you guys. <laughs> Sorry, am I, I know it's time to leave probably. Uh, this is a, a residence that was on a hill. They had a New York City architect <laughs> and they called me in a little late. I'll show you uh, the state of things when I first came in, but it's a similar concept to my house uh, in that I propose these stepped gardens to kind of slow the water down. The architect put a, a garage under the house, so the house is up on a hill and then a subterranean garage. So uh, when I came to it, this is what it looked like. And um, they wanted me to come to the rescue on this. So I proposed using this Hillfiker retaining wall system. Um, there are these things called spiral nails. They're like dead men, basically. But you don't have to use concrete, which I love about it. And so this is probably a six or seven foot wall here. Uh, and then you can plant in it. And this is my inspiration. We have these dripping springs out in the hill country. Uh, and so this is that wall that I showed you that was just dirt <laughs> or soil, and um, it just works perfectly. Um, you know, it takes a little babying to get the plants going and everything, but um, so that's how it looked when it first went in. That's the soil fabric behind. It, my client just did not want a lot of plant species, so we used a very simple palette. One of the first things you notice about this house when you come in is the driveway, so we designed it so that it didn't feel so driveway-like with uh, gravel and concrete. And then he had a little ephemeral creek on the side of the property, and uh, we designed a little circular deck to overhang that. Up above here is a lawn uh, for their kids. And when they water the lawn, it actually seeps on down, uh, seeps through these retaining walls. And it's like his own little dripping spring there. Um, <clears throat> this is the Hippo Ranch. This is my last project, so we're almost done. This is uh, what the ranch house looked like before. In typical ranch, where they let the ranch vehicles go all over the place, um, you know, they have full reign of the place. And my client was a single woman. She wanted to create a compound. She wanted to feel protected from the, you know, all these wild animals. I mean, it's like an 8,000 acre ranch. Um, and so we worked to uh, create sort of a system of retaining walls that held up the grade and created a place for her to have parties. This, uh, I work a lot with Lake Flato. This is, they renovated the house and then they did this structure. It's a shade structure and a mirador. You can go up to this roof and see really far away. It's really beautiful. But this was the plan. Um, it's a slightly sloping lot, so these are retaining walls that sort of create this precinct around the house and built a pool that's sort of like trough-like that's built right into that wall. This is where we did the seating out where those ranch vehicles had been. We used buffalo grass sod to sort of hold some of the edges where the water I mean, they can get some torrential rains out here, even though it's very, very dry. Um, but this is after it's grown a little bit. Uh, we use the old Frank Lloyd Wright masonry 
uh, desert masonry technique of these walls, the cast in place uh, concrete. We mixed a lot of real rough sand in it to get a lot of texture. You know, the contractor, he, he sort of did it okay. I mean, it's not as good as Frank Lloyd Wright did, but anyway, it looks good. It blends in with the uh, desert. Uh, there were existing pecan trees on the site, and my client wanted a lot of shade, so we created one little new grove of pecans for her uh, to have a shady place for a picnic table. Just uh, again, this is a buffalo grass lawn. We did a little buffalo plinth deck by the pool. This is at the bunkhouse. Anyway, that's my last slide. Anyway, thank you.